Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious. Beside me today is a good friend of our museum for over a decade, Mr. Eric Baker. Good to have you here, Eric. Thank you. Thank you. We've uh, Eric uh, had a 30-year career in the shuttle fabulous uh, three decades of flying those reusable spaceships. He ended up being what's called a TPE, a test project engineer. He's got a beautiful little patch there to prove it. We're going to talk about that today, too. Eric, how are you? We haven't seen you in our museum in a while. He was on the show in July 2020, helping us out in the middle of COVID pandemic, and we're finally glad to get you back. Well, I'm glad to be back. They, uh, you said that you could ask more questions, and I got more data. There you go. That's right. Well, you know I bug you when I see you at events there, and uh, things work out the way they do. Maybe we'll have Eric back on a more frequent basis as he uh, is a good friend of Marty Winkle, my co-producer behind the Streamlabs computer there. Marty, good to see you there. I enjoyed the banner between you and Eric talking shop from uh, the shuttle era there. And uh, uh, you're writing something down there. Why don't you say something about Eric? Gosh, that's tough. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I started. There was, was only 10,000. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, right. When I started the shuttle program just about six months before Eric did. And I remember when he came on board and he was impressive at that time and he was impressive 30 years later. Well, that's good. And you guys have been friends. That's always cool. I love hearing the shuttle guys talk shop. I don't understand a lot of it, but then, you know, uh, that's why we're here and you're there watching Stay Curious so we can learn more about this fabulous era that changed our lives. And uh, there's some people kind of worried that the shuttle era will be forgotten about, Eric. That's why we're here, isn't it? But uh, here, we wanted to get a little current events out of the way here and get Eric involved in it. But you've, uh, you bop in and out of our museum. Tell tell our friends out there your impression of our humble little tribute to the space worker like yourself. Well, it's a, it's a fascinating uh, amalgamation of stuff that the Space Center and the various projects have thrown away. And all the people who've ever worked out there, you know, we've always loved the space program. And so if something goes to uh, the Ransom Road site where it's going to be surplused, people will go down and they'll buy it with their own money, hoard it in their homes until their wives or husbands say, <laughs> you got to get this stuff out of here. <laughs> and, and it ends up with us. <laughs> and, and, and many, many years ago, uh, Charlie Mars and, and a, a group of like-minded people put this thing together and started collecting it. This is about what the the fourth or fifth building that they've been in and out yeah, of. I think it's six, two malls six. and yeah. and uh, a bunch of other little places. But, uh, but it's it, important. Yes, though. I'm an outsider. I I fell in love with this place and actually moved here to be part of this museum from uh, 35 years in East Tennessee. And to me, it's this legacy is very important. And I'm just fascinated meeting people like you. Uh, the hands-on of these 135 launches of, of, of the greatest spaceship built yet. Uh, and, uh, you know, I could just heap accolades on you like that. But thank you for what you say about our American Space Museum as we take it seriously that we preserve the birth of America's space age right here in this delivery room, Brevard County. And you can't get any closer than that. In fact, we'll show some pictures about a noisy rocket going off in the middle of the night last night. But first, Eric, let's have a, a few little uh, public relations things here. We really appreciate Nick Thomas for his once a month uh, contribution to Stay Curious. He talked about the great crew of Apollo 12 and uh, the, the, the buddies that they were. Uh, of course, Al Bean, led by Pete Conrad and Dick Gordon. Uh, we got Mikey Haddad on tomorrow, a very important mission, 51A, where they rescued two satellites that were left in orbit and brought back in 1983. Incredible. You may have uh, been involved in that somewhat, were you? Well, when I started working I, with Rockwell, I was working DPS, which is the data processing system, on board the orbiter. Mm -hmm. And so we basically took care of the onboard computers. We took care of the man-machine interface. 
we eventually took care of the robot arm installation. And so for all of those early flights, when I was the five years I was in DPS, my most of my time was spent in the firing room monitoring the computers, mm -hmm. powering them up, powering them down, uh, ch changing formats, and supporting everything that you needed to uh, to do a launch. And so we, we, after every flight, we would do a basic checkout of the computer systems, the uh, what was called the uh, CODS, which was the uh, onboard display systems. And CODS is, is just an acronym for your call sign in the fire room. Mm -hmm. It was a subset of CDPS. The C stood for the control room. Mm -hmm. And so if you were in the OPF, you know, you had a, uh, a call sign associated with that. But uh, for DPS, we would load the computers for flight. Mm -hmm. And for like STS-1, I had been there for about nine months and I was working on second shift. And that was in the timeline for the launch countdown as when we loaded the, you know, the main computers in the orbiter with their data for flight. Wow. And basically what that means is, you know, we just did the call outs and such where it, the computers access the mass memory units that had been loaded mm -hmm. earlier, but it had uh, the, the memory in the computers was such that it couldn't put an entire mission in the computer. Really? Okay. So they had to divide it up into subsets of ground checkout, uh, launch and ascent uh -huh. on orbit and then descent. Huh. Well, we'll get more into that as we talk about the mission we're going to talk about today, STS-9, John Young's last trip to space, his sixth mission, and his seventh rocket launch. And we'll tell you why that happened in there in a minute. Uh, you a football fan, Eric? Oh, yes. And you root for who? Uh, the Miami Dolphins. Okay, that's good. That's good. I'm a suffering Cleveland Browns fan most of my life, but the yeah. Dolphins looking good. How about college? The uh, my college did not have a football team. Okay. So they do now. I went. I I graduated. You see that? No, no, no. I went to uh, Florida International University down in Miami. Okay. All right. And so I, I, I follow to a certain extent uh, U of M, uh, Florida State, and then Florida. Well, if I had a big old, uh, as leading up to big old, there you are, up there. Let's talk about that. We'll talk about football in a minute. I'm a little out of skilter there that I wanted to get Chris Stott in there. Chris is going to be our guest on Friday. Talk about putting your data and all that shuttle data and so forth on the moon. In case anyone want to archive it and look at it later, Chris Stott, who's the husband of astronaut Nicole Stott, uh, well, we recorded a show. Marty, it was fascinating, wasn't it? Uh, you're going to enjoy Chris Stott. He's so um, uh, uh, he, he's very succinct in what he's telling telling you. He's a very intelligent man, but there's a big reason behind what they're doing. His company, Lone Star. Uh, and he's wrangled a whole bunch of important people. And eh, I'm going backwards there. There we go. All right. So anyway, Mikey Haddad Wednesday, Chris Stott on Friday. And we had you October a year ago. There's a beautiful shirt that you wore. There's a story behind those mission logos of the shuttle. That's beautiful. Right? You said someone made that for you. Oh, yes. Uh, my, uh, my youngest sister, who is a, a, a talented seamstress, she did. She also worked at the space center for about ten years. Okay. And for uh, Boeing for configuration management. All right, configuration but, uh, management, a CM. That's a lot of well button crunching and you had to crunching. keep track of everything because if anything goes wrong, you got to know you got to have a, a paper trail. Yeah, and I I've I've known a couple of those CMs. It's amazing. Uh, they got at at their their at their access millions of parts and, and schematics and all kinds of stuff like that. Well, uh, good for your sister there. There you are uh, when we had John stay curious, old school way. 
but I was talking about sports and, and football because I've got a big plate of crow to eat as my Buckeyes got beat by the team up north. There's uh, there's Dave Stangy right there. I see the background there, Marty. There's there's the score, 30 to 24. What a thrill for you to be there, Dave, though, and we appreciate your support of American Space Museum with your wife there, Marty. No, no that's not his wife. That's his daughter, Jessica. Okay, daughter Jessica. All right, so great. Thank you for answering my question there, Dave. I told you I'd put that up there. He's really our number one fan. Uh, has followed us since uh, almost day one, him and Larry Pushkar and uh, a bunch of them have followed us. Uh, Gary Gerald, I know Gary's watching today in, in Georgia, but uh, quite a, a, anybody that's never been to any kind of football game where you got 100,000 people at it, it is an event. I mean, it's ramped up from the 30 or 40,000 you may go to at uh, some of the other ones there, but they beat us fair and square and and hope they can uh, carry the torch all the way to the national championship. Uh, that team up north there, that starts with an M mm. up there. So, well, you've got a, a guest scheduled for next week, uh, Rick Horner. Yes, and he is a, a Florida State alumni. Okay, and so he had season tickets for many years, and I would often go up to Florida State. All right, so we uh, we watch. You know, we, it was so long ago. We remember when Deion Sanders was playing. Oh my gosh, that is that that had been fascinating to watch yeah. him play. Oh yeah, and that's Rick uh, Horner. Yeah, Rick Horner. Yep, he's going to be our guest next week. We getting a new slate of people uh, for your staying curious, viewing pleasure, and I will not always know everyone showing up because I'm getting some help to do that. I'll know it hopefully a day ahead of time. But um, anyway, we want to. Uh, Give uh, eat me a little plate of crow here since that team up north beat beat the, the Buckeyes and uh, Chris Callie also a great artist he's an alum up there uh, but uh, always great to run into this lady uh, Joe Ann Morgan a great supporter of the American Space Museum she's shown here with Caroline Shoemaker who's the CEO and president of the Astronaut Scholarship Foundation. A very important organization founded by the Mercury astronauts that gives away has given away millions of dollars in scholarships to kids. I know you know about ASF. Maybe you've been involved with them. But Joanne Morgan, the legend there, the only woman in the firing room for Apollo 11. And then she ascended, broke the glass ceiling for a lot of women in a lot of shuttle jobs. I think she was over the Human Space Flight Office for a while. Is that, do you know much about that, Joanne? No, uh the name was familiar. Uh, we had uh, we had several uh, women engineers in the test project office when I was there. Uh, when I started in DPS, uh, we had one uh, lady who was helped with our software, mm -hmm. and then uh, but we had a we had a about a third of our office and test project was was women and we'll see a bunch of them here with pictures of you that we pulled off there our test project engineers uh joanne morgan thank you very much for your support of our american space museum there she is a titusville native and actually applied for the job at kenny space center encouraged by the postmaster the popular place to post jobs in the 60s was the post office and, uh, next to the wanted posters? Not one. Next to the wanted posters, exactly, because they were in the know of who needed a workforce there. Carolyn, always uh, wonderful to see her at Astronaut Scholarship Foundation events that uh, we personally support here at the American Space Museum. This was Nicole Stott's breakfast that we enjoyed a couple weeks ago. And there is our good buddy, uh, Carlton Bailey, streaking again in the middle of the night, Car uh, has caught a, a rocket launch of a Falcon 9. The moon had a beautiful ring around it there caused by atmospheric crystals. Uh, and they're a good shot there, Carlton. Uh, that was about 11.20 last night. I nodded out. I was going to try to make it, but no, I, I've been pretty wore out. Uh, and uh, yeah, kind of unusual for me not to want to see a rocket launch, but geez, what is that this year? 
83, 84 yeah, total uh, for yes. SpaceX. SpaceX is just 50 something they, on they the are, coast. They are leading the way. Well, we think about that being a person that, that watched a shuttle go off, oh, you know, four or five, maybe seven times a year, and then um, having a well, 10 year period of just four or five rocket launches a year, and now it's four or five a month. Yep. We the we peaked at uh, I think nine missions for shuttle, uh, in one year, mm -hmm. just prior to uh, the loss of Challenger, and that was with the amount of work we had to do. That was that was a that was a busy 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 time. Okay. So even if you're uh, if you weren't you know working on the launch, and we didn't have enough people you know, to have like only dedicated people for each orbiter. Right. So whoever was launching those, that crew, you know, had launched the last one. Now there were subsets, you know, that were getting the next orbiter ready, but the, uh, the amount of experience you needed in the firing room, you know, for the countdown was, was limited because some of them had to be on second shift. Some of them had to be on third shift. Uh -huh. And so, the uh, it was it, it was busy. I'm proudly wearing an OPF shirt here. As well, of, you should. One of your uh, one of your workplaces there. Yeah. Now OPF three. What most people probably don't understand is that that building uh, was all the stuff that was inside of it for the orbiter came from Vandenberg. Oh, really? As a matter of fact, uh, Kay Heyer, one of our astronauts, who was a test project engineer, she started as a mechanical engineer, basically certifying, you know, OPF-3, you know, for use before she came on with the uh, mechanisms folks. That's interesting. We'll see a picture of Kay Heyer, the first uh, shuttle worker to become a shuttle astronaut. In there, I think she was the first one. Uh, there were three. There were several. Her and uh, May Jamison, Nicole Stott. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, it was um, uh, uh, not May Jemison. Well, she was one of them. She came oh, out she? of the payload world. Okay. All right. Well, uh, they had high dreams, and they made it up there to space after working twisting the, the nuts and bolts on the the shuttle. One other. Uh, Carlton's picture there. Thank you again, CB. And uh, if you didn't know, Mattel has joined the space, new space age. And Mattel just, Matchbox, I mean. Matchbox. Uh, a lot of us boys and girls grew up with the Matchbox cars. And, and now they've got a whole collection of the Falcon 9 rocket, the Crew Dragon, and the Starship there for your, uh, your sale there. So, Carlton, you'll be out there grabbing that. To put up there with all your Godzillas, buddy. But let's get to uh, one other little thing of note, Marty. I went out to the Space Center, saw uh, uh, Fred Gregory today, the astronaut du jour. They got a beautiful display of trees out there sponsored by, I think it's uh, uh, Harris Corp. But uh, they've got a Apollo tree. They've got an International Space Station tree. They've got a Artemis tree, Mars tree, all right? They got a moon tree. No trees on the moon. No, no trees, trees no, Mars. but they got one there all dressed up with moon stuff. But the one in the foreground is the NASA tree, and it's the only one I could find a shuttle on. There's no shuttle tree at this magnificent thing. But there's a shuttle on top of this one in the foreground. But we're going to show you those as we get closer to the holidays. And I'm out there to photograph them in lights. But this is why we love talking about the shuttle. It might end up being a, a, a neglected chapter of space flight uh, when the International Space Station goes plunging into the Indian Ocean. What do you think? Well, it like any part of history, you know, you, you've got to uh, you've got to teach it. You've got to understand where everything came from. The some of the remarkable stuff that uh, SpaceX is doing now with landing their boosters. 
it's the processing power of the computers that can do that. The, you know, we really, had, really, that's the big, the big oh, yeah. uh, incentive is uh, mm -hmm. if they didn't have that process, if they were trying to use the computers from the orbiter, you know, they, they couldn't do it. It just, there's just not enough uh, speed and uh, processing power in it. Hmm. I mean, you know, we went to the moon on 4k of memory. Yeah, 64k indeed. And the, uh, we had 128k, I believe in, in the computers, uh, for the orbiter and that was eventually doubled when they went from two boxes to a single box computer and that's because they went from the the bulky ferrite core non-volatile memory which means you turn the power off you don't lose the data mm -hmm. and then that was the ap 101a and then they went to the s model which went to a dynamic ram but it had a battery backup they mm -hmm you know, put on that and, but we couldn't, the, there wasn't enough memory within the computer to do an entire, you know, orbiter mission from lift off to landing. So they had to break it up into sections mm -hmm. with the computers and the memory they have now. That's how they can, you know, program something to as dynamic as a re-entry turnaround and, and you know, they can land back here at the uh, landing zone one, depending on the the orbit they're going to, or they have to land on the drone ships. But even those, the uh, the Falcon 9 is a a medium lift vehicle. But it it you'll notice that they don't take up the really heavy satellites because unless they're going to throw away the first stage when when they do that they have to empty the tank if you're going to land it you've got to have something to burn you know to turn it around and uh -huh. then just descend and and for the final landing firing so so it's the computer memory boom that's really behind the rocket renaissance of oh, all yeah. these companies ever yeah to do things that uh... i mean there's a certain amount of uh you know advancements in in metallurgy for the components for the engines and stuff like that but it's the it's the software that controls them nowadays and very interesting we're talking to eric baker here he spent 30 years of his life with the space shuttle uh era there uh we're going to get into eric uh here a little bit uh, right now we're going to get into him i mean there's a picture of you uh being a volunteer with a bunch of kids as we've called you upon to do this time and time again share with everybody a little bit where you grew up and what kind of family life you had and how did you get turned on to rockets? Well, I grew up, I was born in Ohio, so I'm a Buckeye like yourself. There you go. You said Springfield. Springfield, Ohio. But my mother did not like the cold weather. And so she said, we're going as far south as we can get. Okay. So we went down to Miami when well, I was five. as far south as you can get. Wow. And uh, so I spent my formative years in uh, Miami, Florida, and both my parents read a lot of science fiction. So we had, you know, oh, really? shelves and shelves of books. Huh. And we also had a whole section of books. Uh, before there was the internet, there were things like the Encyclopedia Britannica and a series of books called the All About Books. Oh, yes, yes. And one of them was all about rockets and jets. And it gave, a, you know, for a young reading audience, something that was designed for, you know, not college student type stuff, but just a, 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 a nice background of where the stuff came from, uh -huh. you know, the Chinese gunpowder and, you know, the uh, Congreve rockets, the rockets red glare. There you go. Those uh, basically came from uh, that technology. And so I had read all those and I'd read science fiction. And as we were growing up, you could still go to the drugstore and you could buy the components for gunpowder. Yeah. Now, just about every single engineer that I came across at the space center did model rocketry okay 
my brother and I, when we were like in junior high, we did it. We made our own gunpowder hmm. with my mother's blessing. You know, okay. You know, we had uh, paper routes. We had our own money. We, you know, we you could go down to the drugstore and buy potassium nitrate, which was really used for agricultural, for animal husbandry type purposes. But we knew that you needed it with charcoal and sulfur to make gunpowder. Uh -huh. And so we did, and we made our own little skyrockets, and we could, uh, and, and they actually took off. Huh. And then uh, later on, we it. got into the Estes rockets, which were, you know, came with the built-in uh, prepackaged engines, and you could get. I, did, I mean, had a model of the Saturn V. Uh, we had uh, a number of different uh, rocket models that we put together. Some were paper, some were plastic, and you just snapped them together. But some of our fellow engineers, they really got into it, and they, you know, did liquid fuels. My, my. And uh, we had one of our uh, test conductors was so far into it that he uh, he kept a doer of liquid oxygen in his garage. So... <clears throat> We might see one of his pictures in that group I have. Is he one of the guys? Uh, no, he's not. One, he, no, okay. the, he was a test conductor. So you had it in your blood. You went, really got into it. And uh, obviously, uh, probably living the dream when you got hired well, by Rockwell. I, I went into the Air Force and to pick up electronics. And that's where I learned my basic computer science. And I worked on a system on the F-4 Phantom II. Uh, airplane and it had a computer uh, controlled bomb nav system using Loran C. Loran C, which st stands for long range navigation, was based on a British system that was started in World War II. Uh -huh. And but it was basically a ground based GPS, it was, it was done with timing. Of a, uh, a a primary uh, transmitter and to, and uh, reflecting, so you get a primary signal, then you get responses, and your receiver could be anywhere in a, a geographical area, and tell you where you were, and with the computer that was attached to this receiver, you could put a bomb, you know, within meters of anything. Huh. So all of that led me to when i got out of the service worked for a while went back to school got my engineering degree and one of the uh my fellow students was a co-op working up here at the space center got me an application and that's how i, I started working up here <laughs> In 1980, you in said. 19, started 1980. In... That, that's fascinating. Of course, the first launch of the shuttle, STS-1 in 1981. Let's talk about STS-1 in 1981. was commanded by the great Mr. John Young. And then in 1983, he was taking his last trip to space. Uh, this is the patch of uh, Columbia. Let's relive a little bit of history here. Uh, as we've, we've talked about, we don't want people to lose the history of the shuttle and quite frankly this is a very historic mission uh america's most accomplished astronaut john young was launched november 28th 1983 for the seventh time in his illustrious career as commander of space shuttle columbia uh, and a record-setting six astronauts were on board the most ever put in space doing the first serious science in space lab and I wanted to read what it says about the, this patch here, because we uh, doesn't say a lot, but we find a lot of meaning in this. The major payload for STS-9 is Space Lab 1 and is depicted in the payload bay of the Space Shuttle Columbia. The nine stars and the path of the orbiter tell the flight's numeric designation in the space transportation system sequence. A uh, rather short uh, clip there. Doesn't say who made this. It's one of the patches I really enjoy seeing there. And a record six astronauts. Um, you said you, you you had some doings with John Young. We're going to talk about John Young at the end here uh, with Eric. 
But seven launches in Young's career. Okay, and here's the walkout photo by our friend Tom Usiak up in Pennsylvania right now. Don't know if it's snowing up there, Tommy, yet, but I know it's cold. And his brother Mark are partners with the museum sharing their uh, launch photography of over 60-some shuttles, Eric. Um, so I say Young leading the pack there had seven launches in his career. Let's see. Well, here's the launch. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. How many missions did he have? How many launches did he have? Um, here's what I wonder. He's wearing these coveralls. Okay. Uh, I wonder what John Young was thinking about wearing flight suit coveralls instead of the air-regulated spacesuit of his uh, five previous launches. He must have felt like he was going to Bahamas or something in a convertible. I don't know. Uh, but I always thought, why would they do that? Why wouldn't they want him just a little bit safer with, with some Well, stuff? they did have a helmet. Yeah. And basically, the helmet was for emergency egress at the pad. And so that if they it had a, uh, it was basically a clamshell helmet that they could wear and allowed them to go through a toxic uh, gas cloud if, if needed. Right. Also heard from a couple astronauts that Marty and I've heard talk about that the helmet suppressed the sound, that it was so doggone noisy in that cockpit when the SRBs took off. Oh, I don't doubt that. That uh, it was a, uh, a, 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 a hearing aid thing for them. Now, STS-9 was the last time the original numbering system was used until STS-26. Uh, the next launch in February 84 would have been designated STS-41B, which we talked about. The four is the fiscal year, 1984. The one is launched at Kennedy. Two would have been Vandenberg, but they never did. And the B is sort of the A, B, C, D of the mission schedule, right? Yeah. Did that drive you all crazy when you switched we, to that? No, nobody that I know at the at KSC ever liked that numbering system. We just, I mean, we didn't care if they got out of order from you know like nine. If if they if a mission got delayed, which they did, they got yeah. jumbled up number one. And uh, so they they jumbled up the ABCs, you know, because once they got a number, you know, they started printing patches and stuff. They they had to keep it. Wow. But uh, it seemed a little convoluted for the space yeah. workers. Well, it we didn't really care about the mission number, the yes, the, the patch number, because our flights, like our uh, all of our documentation was based on the tail number and its flight number. So if you were working the fifth flight of, or the, in this case, the ninth flight of Columbia, you know. That was tail number 102. Mm -hmm. So if you picked up a piece of paper, uh, an interim problem report, it was 102-9- mm -hmm. you know, a, a sequential number. Yeah, they had launched Challenger, of course. So this would have been the uh, sixth flight of Columbia right. in space. So the, the six would have been followed right. Right around with the OV-102. Right. And uh, interesting, interesting. All right, that's why we have space workers on like this. And love bragging about our UCAC brothers launch photography like that. Look at that, Eric. God, the raw power there. Marty's SSMEs there, the perfect little diamond shooting out of them there. And, and uh, that raw power uh, of the uh, solid rocket boosters there. That was what? Uh, uh, you just don't get the crackle. You know, with a, a lick, just a, a plain liquid engine. Yeah. That if you don't have any solids on it. Okay. And uh, that's a great shot, remote shot by uh, Mark Usiak or Tom. There's a, a telephoto view of it roaring off the pad there. And another, what? I guess we had the third shot. Where's the other thought? So we had another one of that. Uh, well, I'll bet that was. Probably didn't load that one, Marty, did I? Yeah. We had another launch photo in there that didn't, maybe I didn't put it in there. Maybe it'll jump up here later. But there's what uh, Eric's wearing today. I said, I'm going to take a picture of that because you all strike me as being a proud lot, the test project engineer. And there is their logo. And uh, who made that logo? Well, I did. Uh... 
I basically uh, stole the um, the mailed armored fist from the Strategic Air Command logo, where they uh, they had uh, lightning bolts coming out of it, and because in test project engineering, one of our main jobs was <laughs> to work in the control room, fire rooms one through four. And we basically, there was always us and the four major subsystems. And if you look at the, at the patch there, it's, uh, there's a, a data tape with ones and zeros for DPS. There's a lightning bolt for the uh, electrical folks. Uh -huh. There's a tube with uh, fluid in it for the, uh, the cooling and life support. And then there's a uh, electronic cable for instrumentation. I got it. So there yeah. was those four engineers and a TPE in there at all times, basically monitoring the health of the vehicle. All the other subsystems would come and go depending on the scheduled testing for the day. So we were decided we were going to do a, uh, a team building activity and, and get some, uh, some jackets made. And these were basically uh, baseball jackets that you could go down to the uh, local sporting goods store that did them for like the local high schools. And yeah, stuff right. Like yeah. Old school. And uh, you just had to get a design and they would make up a silk screen. And uh, we all uh, That's bought awesome. them in various colors. We had a, an LSU graduate and his was a purple <laughs> with uh, the white and yellow of the uh, the logo. So he was happy with that. Well, there's uh, that launch again. We'll get back to test project engineer TPEs, a uh, acronym that you or uh, that you taught me. Of course, in there, in there, we got a bunch of the test project engineers. Who we have there with you, there in the well, that's left uh, side. That's Sue Herman, mm -hmm. uh, Sue Goltz now, and myself, uh, Greg Koch. Greg Koch's in the back with the with long the beard. white. Larry Clark. Larry Clark's a board member of ours. Kay Hire. And that's astronaut K hire later on. Correct. Of course. Yes, Very delightful. I, I lady. remember her uh, working with our supervisor at the time, Dave Henson, uh, basically going through all the things to maximize her chances of selection. With uh, she got uh, uh, dive certified. She, uh, you know got a, a master's degree out of, uh, from FIU hmm. in, uh, I think it's space technology, but uh, it was one of the, the very first uh, master's degrees that you could, you could get space related. Hmm. Interesting. That's and then, Melinda and then, Tribe. And Melinda Tribe. Uh, whose husband, John Tribe, was on our show. Very popular Apollo hypergolics expert for yeah. Rockwell. And of course, he worked, you probably worked with John too, did you at all? Well, yeah. Well, he also took care of the hyper systems for uh, the orbiter. Yeah. And then he moved up the, the chain in Boeing and he was, uh, the I believe, the head of the whole Boeing engineering here. Toward the end of the well, we love them both, program. Melinda and John Tribe. We love you. They're great supporters of our American Space Museum. We try to, good we, people, aren't we? They? Keep trying to talk Melinda into doing a talk. I know it. Yes, but so she resists. She resists it. There, Kay wants to be on the program, uh, but she's Kay hired there. But she's got a commitment with the BBC broadcasting system in in England that uh, when that expires, but. Um, uh, you know, did did uh, uh, any other people aspire like Kay to be uh, an engineer? I know we were talking about um, the fact that uh, Nikki Stott became one there. Joan Higginbotham, yeah, is uh, also was a uh, worker out there. She become a, an astronaut, and she's I believe she's still an Artemis astronaut in there. But uh, that was that's didn't happen every day, of course. Right, it had to with, be special with, motivated people. Well. Even if, uh, I mean, you know, a lot of them, if they couldn't, you know, they got the, they got, say they got a, a degree in astrophysics or medicine or something. If they couldn't get selected just with that, a lot of them went and got hired on by one of the, 
the space centers, JSC, KSC, and just use that to enrich their resume so that, you know, the next time around that uh, it would give them a, a better chance out of the thousands upon thousands who would apply. Yes, absolutely. It was a, a very rigorous uh, uh, trying to figure out what do I need yeah. to be more presentable to the next astronaut board. Because like in the test project office, you generally needed five years of experience in some shuttle system. Oh, so gotcha. we, had, we had people that worked uh, external tank. We had people that worked the solid rocket motors. We had, you know, orbiter people because we had more systems per se uh, in our, the picture you have up there, uh, Sue worked, uh, she did fuel cells. On the far left. I did DPS, uh, Greg Koch, he did uh, ECLSS. Larry Clark was an SRB guy and then he was actually, and then a TPE, then he went back Solid to SRB. Kay was a mechanical engineer with uh, Orbiter and and then she became a TPE. Melinda. And both uh, uh, Coke and Kay uh, did uh, the uh, spacesuit, the EMU checkouts, oh. uh, when they loaded them for each mission. Is that right? Yeah. And then Melinda did, uh, she did uh, system software and then MPS and then TPE. Now, would you switch around from missions or would you always, uh, uh, for example, Sue, or, I mean, uh, K you always work with the spacesuits at the end or anything. Like well, that. we all did console general orbiter work. And so, you know, we all did uh, vehicle processing from, you know, start to finish for any mm -hmm. given mission. Uh, we had a tendency to work one particular orbiter. Uh, when I uh, started as a TPE, I worked uh, and there were vehicle leads. And the vehicle lead for like 103 was uh, Steve Black when I was working. And he uh, he went to all the meetings and he would delegate to us things like keeping track of all the uh, interim problem reports and the PRs and the open paper and uh -huh. uh, whether or not all the connectors have been retested and then filter all that and he would uh, put together like the engineering briefing for the flight crew uh, for each mission. I eventually became the 103 lead. And so I I did those things. Now 103, what tail number, what or orbiter? That's Discovery. Discovery, the, the most flown 39 flights, I believe most yes. traveled. Yeah, the uh, at the Johnson Space Center, which of course is where mission control is, uh, we spoke different dialects of the same language. Mm -hmm. uh, JSC always referred to the orbiters by the name, okay. Discovery, Columbia. For the most part at KSC, we referred to them by tail numbers. I gotta go to the 103 meeting. I gotta go to the you know 104 meeting. Uh -huh. And it's, it's- 104 Atlantis, 105 Endeavor. To correct. End up there. Yeah. And at JSC, the subsystems where we would say DPS, they would say DIPS. Okay. We would Which say. Which remind everyone what DPS means again. Data processing system. Data process. And they would say DIPS. Yeah. Like it sounds. Okay. They would, they would pronounce the acronym. <laughs> and wow. if they would, uh, we would say ECLSS, Environmental Control Life Support System. Yeah. They would say equals. Really? And we would just look at them and go, now that's just weird. <laughs> okay. That, that's, uh, I've heard a lot of that. There's, there's a different culture in Houston and Kennedy Space Center. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and the Kennedy Space Center involved with everything to launch that rocket. And when it clears the title tower, bingo, you go home. No, no, we don't. Oh, you didn't, huh? We we didn't have, uh, we no longer had control. Right. But uh, for the first, oh, I don't know if Marty remembers, but we would actually have people on console for the, the, the big four systems, 
and then especially like PRSD, uh, all through the mission through landing, just monitoring data. And eventually, I can't remember if it was you did that, right? Oh yeah, yeah. And so we would have, we would have like paper maps of all the all the uh, the orbits, and it wasn't until about halfway, maybe a third to a halfway through the program, where they said we didn't have to do that anymore. You could still <clears throat> later on when we got uh, the office computers and you could get the data stream piped to your office, you could still watch uh, a mission. Huh, interesting. I'm fascinated with what Eric Baker's telling us about his job as a test project engineer. And here we got uh, uh, five of his other friends there. That was at the Rocket Ranch reunion of 2021, uh, where everybody enjoyed uh, once in November, uh, anyone that worked out the space center is invited to come to the Rocket Ranch reunion. Always a good time. And I've been privileged to be invited as the photographer the last couple of years out there. Yes, the uh, Merritt Island Moose Lodge always yeah, it, it, yeah. Uh, lets us use their facility. And You know, there's very <laughs> few there's very few businesses in in the country that have regular reunions as such. I was a newspaper person for 15 years of my misspent youth okay and i would love to have had a reunion of one of the newspapers i worked with or i actually worked at newsweek magazine it'd be so precious to see those people's faces again uh so what does it what, what does this do uh, this community you, you, you a lot of people keep in touch uh of course it's a small little physical area here merritt island yeah. too but there's uh, also, what, what does that mean? You never move. Nobody moves away. Some of them do that. We've, we've, we have alumni scattered across the United States right now. Uh -huh. uh, my supervisor, he's up in Tennessee, uh, Mike Hunter. Uh, he came, I know Mike Hunter. Yeah. He's in uh, Jonesboro, Tennessee, in fact. Lives uh, outside of Johnson City. Yeah. Yeah. I know, I know where Mike lives because I lived in Johnson City. I know Mike Hunter. He was your supervisor? Yes. Oh, what a great guy. Yeah. yeah he came out of the ET world. Uh-huh. And uh, so we've got people in North Carolina and, you know. Just... Yeah, but what? But they get together. They yeah. stay in touch. What does that mean? Why? What, what, what's the bond? The space program. The uh, Just the fact that, uh, you know what's what's going on now who's still in the program we still have uh tpes uh working at ksc in various other functions uh some transitioned over to nasa especially if they were younger and uh are doing any everything from payload work to uh just taking care of the of the center that's uh well that's it, to me, it's just an awesome group of people that, that uh, did something together that's so meaningful for our country. I mean, this was the nation's, one of their, our biggest resources, these $2 billion shuttles that you were the lead on one of them. And there's another really good group that does uh, uh, get-togethers during the year, uh, the uh, Missile and Range uh Rockets, missiles, and range pioneers, something to yeah, that. Yeah, out of Sands, uh, the the they meet the Sands Museum, that group or. Well, they uh, they have a, like a like a spring and a fall dinner, mm -hmm. and they have people come mm -hmm. in and talk about uh, various space programs yes. and stuff like yeah. that. So, anybody that you know worked out at the uh, KSC or on the. Uh, Canaveral Air Force Station, mm -hmm. now Space Force Station side, uh, because the it's, it's the same type of uh, yeah. camaraderie. Well, we've enjoyed the camaraderie with you, Eric Baker. Marty, we got any questions from any of our Stay Curious watchers out there? Uh, Eric, I'm going to uh, just ask you uh, about 30 years from 1980 to 2011, I know computers have to be the biggest change of that three, uh, 30 years. What else can you say when you went to work in 2005, for example, or 2006, 
what was a big change that wasn't going on in 2085? Well, when I, I mean 1985. <laughs> well, in 1980, when I started, I was amazed that uh, I, I, I assumed a lot more of it would be computerized in the office. Uh, when I was in the Air Force and I started reading Aviation Week and Space Technology, which is the uh, one of the greatest uh, magazines, magazines. Yeah, the Bible of aviation at the time, for sure. And from like 1919. Mm -hmm. And so the articles I started reading when I was overseas in the service, you know, talked about uh, some of the early CAD and CAM computer-aided design, computer-aided uh, manufacturing that was just beginning in the, in the late 70s. And so, you know, we had computers in the control room, the, the LCC, the, the main big mainframes that basically processed all the data from the test sites into the control room and then from the vehicle back to the control room during a countdown. But I was um, amazed that none of that was in the offices. It was all, you know, carbon paper and uh, NCR paper and handwritten uh, if you knew how to type, you might type it up. Uh -huh. uh, the, the big thing was that when the secretaries got the Selectric, you know, typewriters, the electric typewriters with the little. Oh, yeah. IBM Selectric, my oh, favorite yeah. typewriter. Oh, my God. But uh, that was a slick looking, sexy machine, too. With autocorrect. Yeah, autocorrect, uh, right. Know, with, yeah. You know, on the tape. Yeah. But uh, so that was amazing. And then when we first got. Uh, office computers, the, uh, the, the basically the, the chips got big enough because the computers within the orbiter itself were a, a state of the art. I mean, they were a 32 bit processor when oh, wow. you know, when the first, you know, IBM PC and Apple's were eight bits and the, the earlier uh, uh, hobbyist ones were four bit computers. But the, the orbiter computers, you know, were were 32 bit processors, and they were just uh, they were state of the art. Uh -huh. And eventually, everything, the the, the big mainframes behind the the firing room wall, there, they went from we got some of the very first hard drives into the consoles. They were called Winchester drives. I think that was the company that first developed them. And because when we had to change formats from during ground processing, and we wanted to go from a particular, you had to change formats in order to parse uh, the data stream. We had like a you remember how many uh, kilobits we had in in downlist down lake it was like 128 kilobits it was it was was not a lot and so that amount of data you had to, if you needed if you're doing a a flight controls test and you had to have 100 cycles per second of a measurement or higher you had to steal that from somebody else's data stream and so they had a number of different formats just for ground processing to do that. When we started in 1980, when they first got the orbiter in 79, it took them like several weeks just to turn the thing on. <laughs> really? And it usually <laughs> took about an hour or two to power the vehicle up. We eventually got it automated to the, to the degree toward the end of the program that, you know, we could get powered up in 20 minutes and you could power down in less than five. Hmm. But just to change that format for the ground checkout from one subsystem's needs to another could take a half hour because they would have to reload the equipment in the back. Uh -huh. And until they started getting some of that, that new computer, the hard drives and stuff like that, you could then do it, you know, automatically, practically. You could do it in just a, less than a minute. Hmm. So... That was the amount of growth that you had just processing the vehicle. The vehicle was way ahead of the of the ground control system. 
I see. Well, we've had a fascinating hour here with Eric Baker. Marty, I'm going to end, end the uh, slideshow with where we're at uh, there. Uh, thank you, sir. We've got some people watching today. Uh, Eric, we've uh, uh, really enjoyed your expertise. I know you computer geeks out there have enjoyed uh, him talking about the things. We got Steve J. Steve, uh, thank you for supporting the American Space Museum. We are going to talk about your uh, event, and we're going to do that on Facebook, too. Uh, Dave Stangy, of course, watching. Dave For Doug Forrest is in Los Angeles. He's a, an artist, uh, does done these amazing pencil uh, drawings of the Endeavor. Have you seen the new uh, uh, space shuttle book that... Uh, Tom of... Jones. Tom Jones book? No, no, it's a three-volume boxed set. Oh, I have not. Of uh, books, and it's one of Larry Clark's uh, associates wrote it. Okay. And it's, uh, I haven't read it yet because it's one of my Christmas presents. Oh, okay. But it's, uh, the first one is all about, the first volume is nothing but the precursor steps to get to Space Shuttle. Oh. The second book is, is about all of the Space Shuttle systems. And the third book is about the missions. Okay. That's the book we have that uh, Bill... Um... Uh, Whiting found that we all have right now. We're getting all the astronauts to sign them. Oh, okay. I got you. Yeah, that, that's uh, uh, our astronaut club is going strong. Marty's part of that. I'm part of that. Bill uh, uh, has been, uh, William Whiting has been chairing, uh, kind of chairing it for us there. Bill, you're watching. Appreciate that. Uh, he's probably freezing up there. We're cold down here in Florida. I know you've been a Floridian yeah, it, from Miami. Yeah, the book is called Space Shuttle Developing an Icon. Okay. Thanks, Eric. We'll maybe try to do a book review on that. We're trying to find someone to do a book review of some of these books for us. Cynthia Rossi, you might be able to do that for us. She's part of our astronaut gang. Mark Usiak, we enjoyed your photography there, my friend. What a thrill that must have been in 1984 to witness that launch. Actually, it's 83, Mark. Yeah. This is incredible. The ninth flight after April 81 on this complicated machine. And, and, and uh, uh, Cliff Watson is watching from Queensland, Australia, enjoying his springtime down there. Personal friend of mine. I'd say uh, that um, we got Robert Law is watching his evening up in Dundee, Scotland. And uh, he's probably saying, let's have Eric back again. And we will. And Ophelia Salterell is watching in France. Ophelia, I haven't seen your name pop up in a while, young lady. Glad that you're staying curious with us today. So, Eric, really enjoyed what you had to share with us uh, on there. Is there anything I didn't ask you you'd like to share with our audience today? Uh, no. I mean, other than the fact that one of the things I used to do prior to the pandemic was uh, docent at the uh, visitor center next to the Atlantis. Yeah. And uh, being able to interact with the uh, the guests as they came through and just to tell them about the system and about a lot of the times they would ask, you know, grandparents and parents would say, how do you, you know, how do you get out there? And I would tell them that, you know, the type of education, but I also said that, you know, Kennedy Space Center has everything a small city needs. You know, everything from roads and commodes all the way up to the center director. So if you're a, you know, paint contractor, they paint stuff. Yeah. You know, if you're, you know, if you pave roads, they'll have people come in and pave roads. So you can be a part of the space program all over the country, you know, you just have to go out there and and find it it's the, if you're in a college you go down to your intern co-op office and you say where's the, the the closest aerospace company or nasa center and you get good grades and you say i want to intern with you folks because that's where most of the people come from that's right and uh or join the influx of people moving in here by the thousands every day because the space companies are looking for good people. Uh, they're a little bit worried about having enough smart people to fill in some of the, the slots in the next 10 years. And uh, so engineering 
uh, schools and so forth are thriving right now with space lovers. Eric, what a great inspiration. You've been to uh, everybody out there today. Thank you so much for your support Thank you for of the American me. Space Museum. We'll have you back again. We'll get you back in 2024 and not make it so long in there. and Focus okay. on find something that you'd like to share a little bit with or a mission that was one of your favorite ones. As we love talking about the space shuttle era on Stay Curious, and we're all about it here at the American Space Museum where we've got a beautiful gallery. I challenge anyone to have the, the, the kind of shuttle gallery we have yeah. in there, which also includes a windshield, a window frame that you gave our museum. Well, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, a cutout of the 103 Orbiter Discovery that was hanging in the uh, fire room four. There you go. Uh, right, right. People signed it. That's yeah. And, and yeah, we I was signed it. the frame. Yeah. But the uh, the launch director thought it was the the picture was too dark, so we had him redo it, and we signed the new one, and that's what's up there now. Is that right? If it's still there. Is that Bobby Seek? Thought it was too dark. No, 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 or... no. That was that was uh, 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 Linebach. Linebach Mike on Mike. All right. And then so we we had the old one that we they had taken down, and I asked my NASA counterpart, "Well, what are you going to do with that?" He says, "I don't know." I said, "Can I have it?" Sure. So I took it home. And you donate it to museum. We have it proudly hanging in our shuttle gallery above the OPF. In fact, there our, our wonderful model of that. Well. Again, Eric, thank you for supporting the American Space Museum and also all that you do to keep the shuttle era alive. Marty, thank you for a great Streamlabs job today. We'll give a shout out to Trekkie Techie Jessica Galloway for helping us with our label today. And tomorrow we've got Mikey Haddad is going to talk about the shuttle uh, of, the, of November that went up and, and uh, uh, after repairing two satellites, it took them back up on an incredible mission that Mikey says is one of the main achievements of that level four group of engineers there uh, in the uh, space shuttle processing facility. So until tomorrow with Mikey Haddad and two of his friends talking about engineering payloads on the space shuttle, I'm Mark Marquette saying I can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us. <laughs>